It's about awareness and mindfulness, right? You have to be be aware enough to say, wait a minute, why is she looking at me like that? Or wait a minute, something doesn't feel right here. Or wait a minute, can what I just said be misunderstood? I did not understand, you know, when I wrote the book, Managing Annoying People, people said to me, what qualifies you to write this? I'm like, I'm annoying. I'm annoying. I finally saw it. I wrote it at first because... You know, when I managed 10,000 people, I created a team of mini-me's and I figured, oh, these are the, you know, the br- the brightest of the bright, the this and that. And I'm going to show people how to manage these annoying people. And then I realized, I'm the one that did it. I'm the annoying one. Welcome to this chapter of the Business Library, where we're going to be talking about how to form strong relationships and the keys to forming those relationships. We have Elaine Marcus on today to speak about it with her 30 years of experience in executive positions, managed quite a few people in that time. And of course, this episode is sponsored by a free content marketing course. Check that out down below. Elaine's links is all go <coughs> is also going to be there. So check them out while you're there if you hear something that you like. So to start off us strong, like what like how do we form strong relationships? That's for me, not for Mike. Yes. <laughs> we start off by asking questions. Is that for me, not for Mike? We don't <laughs> assume anything. Mm. When you assume, you make, you know, not a good impression. So the first thing we do is we want clarity in our actions and in others. If we don't understand something, we say, excuse me, can you explain that? As soon as we start thinking, we know what you said or what you asked, we're already down a rabbit hole in our head and being who we are and going on a way that isn't going to connect to the other person. It's all about us and what we're feeling. That was definitely starting us off strong. I, Thank you. Because like so many people get caught up in what's in it for me, where people, are, everybody else is much more interested in what's in it for them. So what are some techniques we can use within our communication to actually tailor to people's wants? Because that's a big part of it, I know. Yeah, I think there's a few steps before you can know that, though, Mads. You have to step back and say, who am I? Who am I? Why do I show up this way? Why am I reacting this way? Now, you might ask this question because you're an engineer and you talk data geek or I'm a social worker. I talk touchy-feely, right? We all have a lens that we show up through. So that's part of it. But I think what matters in communication is how we're being perceived by others. So you can't think about how to have a relationship until you know how you're being perceived. So to deep into dig into that, you need to think about what are your drivers. Now, my core topic is about talking to annoying people and everyone gets annoying. And annoying is just an, a, a good lens to look through because, you know, when we, when our amygdala and our, you know, lymphatic system get revved up, we show our true selves, right? We go into fight or flight. And we learn that we get annoyed by three reasons. And those are the same three things I think you can look at to actually figure out how you're showing up. And I call them, the first one is, they're really all mirrors. They're mirrors of who you are, right? Are you showing up as your best self? Are you showing up because that person reminds you of someone that used to really annoy you? Your mother, your sister, an ex-boss, an old, you know, an uh, ex-lover or whatever. So are you reacting to them because you're annoyed? Or are you showing up in a certain way because you like what they have? They have a bigger house. They have a bigger car. They have an office. They have a job you like. And in each one of those instances, they're just basically annoying. They, you know, drink their, you know, they drink their (laughs) drink really loud. Or they always show up with a big pile of papers or, you know, my favorite pet peeve. They always ask the same question. And the first time you meet them, you're like, wow, that person's so smart. What's the data? Da, 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 da. By the fifth time you're in a meeting with them, you ask the question like, don't they have anything else? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear from this guy. So you have to think of, is that you? Are you showing up? Uh, I'll speak for myself. I am a ball of energy. I wasn't always a happy bowl of energy. I used to come home with a lot of anxiety. So even though I was the boss, when I showed up into the meeting room, I was barking orders and getting the coffee and doing this and doing that. And I was revving up the whole room. So I became a mirror for the rest of my staff. They were going to react to me that way. 
So you have to really think about how are you showing up? Is it just annoying? Is it calm, present? Is it, are you looking at someone because you like what they have or are they kind of getting under your skin because they remind you of someone? So, you know, Mads, I met you a few months ago and it could have been, wow, you reminded me of my next door neighbor and that guy used to always steal my raspberries. So I don't <laughs> even know you, but I'm not going to like you because I remember that guy who looked just like you and sounded like you and took my raspberries. So that's the first step to how do we know how we're showing up. You have to be able to look at yourself honestly. You know when you're showing up as your best self. You know yes. when you're in a room and people are being, you know, people are really reacting to you. So once you know kind of your style or who you are, then you have to really think about um, once you know your style, you have to. I just had a perfect point. I was going to make a perfect segue. I'm looking at it. I lost it out of my head. So that's the first thing. Know who you are. The second thing is you have to know how that shows up for you. Does it show up, you know, in fight? That's me. Like I said, I'm going to fight you for my raspberries, even though you never took a raspberry in my life. Does it show up as flight? I'm not really present. I'm not really here. I'm not really engaging. My body language is doing that. I'm sitting back. Or is it showing up in freeze? <laughs> <laughs> Leaving everyone else to question what's going on. So know how you're showing up. Know what you do when you show up that way. And then you can get to the point of your question, which was really, how do we, um, how do we fix how we're showing up? Is that right? How do yeah, we fix yeah. how we're showing up? All right. So I think there are three steps to fixing how we show up. The first is to be genuine. And I've already modeled that today. Are you talking to me? I thought Mike was going to kick it off and you asked the question. I didn't know. So I just said, is that to me? Instead of like freezing or just jumping in, right? I just showed up. I don't know. I'm going to be who I am. So be genuine. If you're not genuine, people can tell. They can sniff it out like a dog. They can tell that you're trying to please them or you're not really showing up with your full self. And even though they might not know what's going on, they know this isn't someone that they feel 100% like is in it with them. So that's the first thing, you know, and it's not about saying, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. You know, I was with someone all weekend who was, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. Okay, we got it, you're nervous. Take a breath through that. So the first thing is to be genuine and know at least what you're feeling inside. That really goes a long way to um, whatever the situation is to, to be able to just show up with someone. The second thing I think is really understanding energy. We talk more and more about this now, um, you know, metaphysics and kind of our ethereal fields and, you know, our calm. I mean, we all know, you know, so many of these apps that have made so much money, but you have to know your energy. I said that I used to show up very energetic, but angry. I don't show up. I hope you're not feeling I don't show up angry anymore. I show up excited to hear what you have to ask. I show up excited to sh share what I have. And that only comes from deep inner work on ourselves. Know what we're fighting against, what we're in it for, and why. And I like to talk about that in three different ways. Am I confusing you with all my three different ways? So there are three different ways people show up. They show up power and money hungry. I want to get a promotion. I want to get the sale. I want to, you know, I want the corner office. I want to be the one in charge. So they look through that end lens. The second lens that people show up through is the mission lens. I don't care what it takes. I want to stop um, homelessness or hunger in the world, or I don't care what it takes. I want to create the next level of, you know, VR, you know, or, or IA or whatever. They're on it for the mission and they're really driven by the information, the science, the conversations. They'll do anything. The third people are people I call lifestyle people. They're really in it to live their life. So if it's work, they're not going to, they're the ones that aren't showing up after five o'clock for a cocktail party. They're ones that they do a good job and they use their brain, but this is their life. They're probably not going to eat lunch with people. They're going to be off running their own errands so they can go home and be with their family. So you have to really know how you are showing up. Don't say, you know, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do this. Sign up for things when you're a lifestyle person. My daughter, I use her as an example all the time. She works for a very well-known company. She heads a very important team, but she is a lifestyle person. 
She is not, you know, unless it's really like, you know, everything crashed. She is working nine to five. She's giving it her all. She shows up, but she's not going out for drinks with the team. She's going to stay remote as long as she can. She's going to remember how's your son, how's your daughter, how was your vacation, but she is not really, you know, in it for anything else than I make a good salary and I want to go, you know, play with my own dog and my own partner. Does that make sense? Yes. How so do you one, build a... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Somebody else talk for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you go about building a good relationship? Um, for example, at my career, I loved my job and I loved what I was doing so that I was always spending extra time because it was fun. But for a period of time, I worked for a lifestyle person that was my boss. How do you build a tight relationship in that situation when someone operates very differently than you do? That is the key question that I was getting to. That is, I think, exactly the disconnect. The first thing is, if you're working for a lifestyle person, never schedule a meeting at the end of the day because they want to leave. They want to get to their mm -hmm. yoga class. They want to get home, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is appreciation that that's not their passion. You're not about trying to sell them on your passion. You're about letting them know this is what is going to make me a better employee for you. Mm. Yeah, that's a so good you lead. don't have to do it, but you got to let me do it. How can we do that? It's a different question. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I, um, I just uh, did a training this weekend and we spent a lot of time on these three groups and like how, you know, if you are, um, you know, the person that's in this for mission, how do you inspire a mission person? You let them go to conferences. You let them read all the latest research. You let them uh, do do extra data. You might buy them, you know, a subscription to LexisNexis or whatever is the hot tool this, these days, because that's going to help them perform better for you because they're interested in that. And they don't mind feeding the whole team that stuff. But if you ask that person to go to cocktails after work, they might not want to do it. They might never want to ever go out with the team as well as the lifestyle mm. person. So then you have a person who's power hungry. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Power hungry and driven by money. What do you do with them? You invite them to um, have a seat at a senior meeting. You invite them into certain meetings where there are higher level people. You get them to understand what those conversations are like. You give them an extra special business trip where they're, they're representing the organization and they get to step into a different role. You find different ways to to for the people for who each one of these people are to let them relate to the organization and to you and that can go for your personal life too right you know that there are people we're mothers together so you know chances are you're not going to want to come on a girls weekend with me and go um you know, quilt through five counties. You're going to want to go on a mother-daughter weekend with me and quilt through five counties. You, you understand what I'm saying? The exact same activity, which one are you likely to come to and which one not, based on who you are. But if we bonded over quilting, the mission, then you might come no matter if it's with our daughters, our mothers, whatever, right? So you understand where I'm going with this concept? I think it's really important about thinking about what drives you and then the person across the table. If they have a different thing that drives them, you're not about convincing them that what you want is what they want. You're about figuring out how do I do my thing and you can help me get there or I can support you. Yeah, I now, really like that. Thank you. I think all of this, you know, one of the key tools you use for getting that explanation across is what I call the data, the delta, and the heart. So, oh, do you hear that? Sorry. That's my espresso machine that's saying, I need one. No. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> it has its own mission. Um, the data, the data, we all know what the data is, the information, how much inputs we're putting. So this goes to now that I know who I am, right, and how I show up, I, I want your job, I show up annoyed, I don't show up annoyed, I show up happy, I like you, who am I in this situation, how do I show up genuine? Once we know that and we know who we are, I'm a mission-driven, I'm a mission-driven person, I'm a mission-driven person, I'm a power-hungry person, which I am too, but mission-driven first, alpha, and then, um, or I'm a lifestyle person. Once I know these things, how do I explain to others who I am and get them to listen to me? How do I deepen the relationship? The way we do that is by, I call it three things, the data, the delta, and the heart. The data is the, inf you know, we know what data is. It's numbers, figures, facts, 
you give them the data. Some people listen and understand through the data. You know, um, uh, give me uh, something. Any any problems you guys are currently working on or something you're thinking about in your lives? Well, acquiring new customers is always a challenge That's for always any a business. Good one. So the data is in customer acquisition. We're moving away from funnels. We, we're moving to, you know, relatable marketing, attraction versus promotion. It's not a numbers game anymore. It's much directed and specific. Here's the data on all these things, right? This, this is how funnels work. This is how uh, market relations or relatable marketing. This is how warm leads work. This is how customer acquisition is turning into. We know it's about an up product now because our best customers are the ones we have, blah, 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 blah. Excuse me, it's always very important to get customers, never blah, 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 blah. But this is what, but this is, this is what the data is. The delta, Greek sign for change, is if we do this, we'll get that. If we buy this new system, if we do more mixers or we do more customer, um, uh, um, not discovery, do more customer interaction engagement. If we give a freemium, if we do these actions, we're more likely to convert this many more people. The change. If I put this input in, what will be the output? What will we be driven by? What will happen? I will have a better relationship. If you reduce the size of my, um, you know, the clients I carry, there's a big one in a lot of companies I work with. If you reduce the size of my customer base, I'll have more time for each customer. It sounds counterintuitive, but if you reduce the time that I'm spending on the customers and shorten the sales cycle, which is always good, I will have more time to be with those customers, add value, and they will grow with us bigger because they feel more hands-on approach. So that's like a delta. And the oh. final one is the heartstrings, how people relate. Um, you know, our customers, we got into this business because... Our, our, we believe our product really changes lives and our customers really deserve to see that. So we really need to slow down and think about one-on-one, -on -one, how we talk to every customer, what we're giving them, what messages, how we talk to their founder stories so they know our founder story so that we can all be kumbaya together and really grow this process. So people take in data one of three ways. It's usually 33, 33, 33.9%, right? Some take the data. I want the facts. I want to know. I need the numbers. Some take the delta. What's the change? What's going to happen? And some take the heart. So you want to be able to talk to whether you're mission-driven and your boss is lifestyle-driven, you're um, power-driven. You want to be able to talk to them in their language. And that's how you deepen the relationship, by using examples that they understand, that make sense in their world, that how they perceive the things they want. You talk in their language. And if you use one of those three things, the data, the delta, or the heart, I would say to everybody, Put in a little of each because you never know, you know, but don't water it down so much that you don't get them. But that is a really good start to deepening a relationship and letting someone know, oh, they get me. Oh, they're speaking my language. Oh, I understand that example. Yeah, I can recall many examples from my own life of seeing two people both speaking Danish. But it looks like they're speaking two different languages because one of them is speaking da data and the other one is speaking to the heart. And it's not just connecting, it's a bunch of mishmash and it's not really working. But to some extent, it's entertaining to watch, especially if you understand both of them uh, and know them. And just, oh, yes, I'm looking forward to explain what actually went on to both of you because you clearly don't get it. However, it can also be very frustrating if you're in that position Correct. of why is this person not getting me? And now that people have an understanding of, the reason why, what is some good questions or a good way to go out and discover which driver each person has? Is it lifestyle? Is it more of the really out there money driven? Which one of the three? Yeah. So how do you get those questions? So obviously it depends on the situation and how you, you're, you're meeting a person. But I um I always like to ask, um, you know, I'm giving you my favorite secret question. You know, where Ooh. was your grandmother from and what kind of food did she cook? 
Oh. And people are going to tell you, oh, let me tell you, my grandmother, her kitchen, the pot, I remember it, blah, 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 blah. Or they're going to tell you, you know what? We weren't anything. So we always ate out. We didn't really focus most on food, blah, blah, blah. Or they're going to tell you, you know, um, I was born this, but my family didn't cook it. But now I live in this neighborhood that has all fresh food and it's across from the United Nations. And I found I love this food and that. So you see the three types, right? Mm. So I think the trick here, and, and, and also this goes to the, our topic, you don't want, you know, not everyone is going to be a friend in business. And we're really talking in a business framework here. But you yeah. want to say enough so they remember you that you asked a good conversation. And I find these days, like with people's names, Mike is an easy name, but you can't really, you know, people are so scared to talk about ethnicity because of everything that's going on. But ethnicity really holds a lot of clues to how people look at the world in their culture and the culture they were brought in and how they come from. And the story of it is, is so many of us have the same experience. You know, um, I, 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 I really hope I don't offend any anyone, but I was on a weekend, you know, I worked for Tech Stars, and we had a great weekend in Las Vegas with, you know, 40 entrepreneurs starting companies. And there was one young kid and he really wasn't feeling well. He had a cold or something. And we were talking and I said, you know, I'm a Jewish mother, go home, get some chicken soup, you know, eat if you're not feeling well. And he looked at me, he goes, Jewish mother, I have an Asian dad, I'm not going home. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But like, you know, in that exchange, because a lot of us, you know, I, because it's the same, we were laughing because I'm like, go home and then come back. You better be here. And he's like, and my father's saying the same thing. No, you stay here no matter what. It's just how you do it. So many of the cultures, we all really come from the same understanding and the same kind of, you know, scarcity or fear mentality because everybody's been persecuted in some way. So I find that that question about your name and your ethnicity really gives me good insight into to people and I learned something about their favorite food and then I can always bond oh look at these potatoes you know you we were talking about potatoes and look at what we're having for dinner so I like that kind of question um another kind of question you can ask especially if you're behavior behavioral I can't say that word behaviorally interviewing is give me an example we all know this question give me an example of a time you played a role on a team that was unusual for you now, everybody's going to have their best story of, oh, when I did this and I did that. Give me a time you had to step into a role that you weren't used to and was unusual. Whether you And I always say, whether it went well or not, I want to know what that was like. So you're asking someone to step out of their comfort zone and explain why they were uncomfortable. That's a really good question. Thank you. Help us learn about the other person. Like, what what kinds of things that bother them are they willing to admit to and it gives us a great clue not to do those things yeah or it gives us a clue of how we started this conversation really is what's their awareness of themselves mm -hmm. what is their awareness because look the bottom line is the world is moving faster and faster i'm moving slower and slower but the world is moving faster <laughs> and faster and the point is is that Everybody is going to hit a wall about something they don't know or something they didn't do right or something that didn't come out right. The question is, how are they going to deal with it? Are they going to be honest? Or are they going to bury it? Are they going to, mm -hmm. you know, be say, well, this is a learning opportunity or this is a blah and I don't want to touch it. Are they going to run from it? So that's really what you're trying to ascertain mostly in your staff before you hire and in working with people. And I would say that's what you're trying to ascertain in life with your friends and your family. Are you going to step oh, yeah. up to the plate or when it gets rough, are you not going to step up to the plate? I want to know who you are. So that's why I asked, tell me a time when you went out of your comfort zone, whether it worked well or not, you were asked to take a different role than you usually take and how did it go? And I imagine, to some extent, that a story that doesn't go well where a person takes full responsibility is even more powerful than the success stories that most people probably bring to the table. I think so. I do. And I think that's the story about how you deepen relationships. You become more yeah. vulnerable. And, you know, I want to um, talk about, like, something I talk about a lot lately, and I do a, a, a training on that is taking on more and more power and prominence is I, I do a three-step training. The first question is, who are you in the organization? So what's the organizational mission? 
you know, how do you relate to it? What we're talking before, are you mission driven? Do you, you know, do you love the power of it? Do you love the lifestyle of this company or the culture? How do you relate to the organizational mission? How does it resonate with you? And, and that really goes to the organization's part. If Not only if you're the CEO, if you're the team, how do I understand that? I did a training for people and they couldn't decide. One person thought the organization, I mean, it's a big organization. It's not the mission on the website. Wait, is it on this site? They didn't even remember what their mission was. And I asked them before the training, what's your mission? So we can pull it apart. So like, what's the mission? And then like, how do I relate to it? The next part of that is how does my team or my role relate to the mission? So what's the overall organization? And when I go to a, you know, a party or, a co you know, or anywhere and someone says, what do you do? I don't say, oh, I work for X, Y, and Z. I can say, I work for a company that changes the way we relate to healthcare. Like, how do you really talk about it? And I'm using healthcare because in my next uh, example, it's my favorite one which is that what's your role in the organization? You have a role on a team. What is your role responsible for? And how much of what the main issue, right, relate the way the customer deals with health care are you doing? We use a famous example here about hospitals. What are hospitals' main business really? Or what's their main risk factor? Or what, what is the biggest game right now in hospitals? Aside from you have time to that, Mike. What? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> It's it's to fix what's hurting. Yeah. And, and and I say to that is to reduce the infection rate. That is their biggest, yeah. right? You know, if, if my hospital's having infections, if people aren't leaving healthier, or if they're, the infection rate is rising, every time you come to the hospital, you get sick, no one's going to that hospital. That means that hospitals had to really dig into the people that clean do the cleaning, the facility mm -hmm. staff. The facility staff was always the lowest person on the totem pole. Now, that doesn't mean that the facility staff should make more than the doctors or the administrators or the programmers, but it does mean that they need a way to think about their role within the organization to deepen that connection. And that is that you're not just cleaning a floor, you are helping people get healthy by not getting an infection. You are on the front line of anti-infection control. It's redefining their jobs so they see their role in the organization, so they can understand it. So that's the second level of how you make it deeper. So I don't go to a party and say, I'm a janitor in a hospital. I go to a party and say, you know what? I help people not get sick. I make sure that that operating room or that doctor's office is clean enough that they're not going to get an infection when they leave. I'm part of the mission. So you help people see their part in the mission. And then the third part of that is your relationship to you and the organization. How do you do your job the most entrepreneurial, creative, efficient way? What respect do you have for yourself that you want to constantly up your game, whether you're a lifestyle person, a power of money person, or a mission person? How are you keeping in that, whatever you're working, nine to five, or for some of us, nine to nine, how are you <laughs> keeping yourself honest. I, you know, I, I'm faster at pivot, I mean, pivot I'm faster at pivot tables. I've learned a new, you know, skill on Figma. I can do this. I'm thinking about how I talk to my customers differently. I'm thinking about an in a way, innovative way that I could hand this piece of my pipeline off to the next person. How are you up in your game in the organization to fit in? And when managers have these conversations with their staff, not about what were your KPIs, what is the meaning of each key performance indicator? What is the meaning of why we do this? Oh, you wash 20 floors so we don't have infection. You wash 20 floors so we can feel safe about our equipment or whatever it is. When you start to have these conversations, then you're starting to deepen the relationships about where you belong in the organization. And there's another impact of this, too, that I think is really key to the question you asked that I'm answering it so long I forgot what the question was. But, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> but, the, but the question... No worries, you're going, I, I, we're going in the right direction. I'm liking what I'm hearing, so keep going. The it's question, probably sad. You ask the question, how do we, you know, something like how do we actually, you know, what, what can we ask? What questions can we yeah. ask so that we can be deeper? So when we start to talk about our role in the organization and who we are, we're starting to ask those questions of who we are. We're starting to think about not just what I think about. Oh, I got 20 floors and only 10 mops today. I'm thinking about what my boss thinks about risk marketplace, right? I'm starting to think about 
other things that aren't usually in my realm. And when I start to think about what the person on top of me is thinking about, I am a much better contributor than staying in my little box. And I can only do that when you help me to figure in what is my mission? What is my role in that mission? And how can I do that job in the best way? So it kind of goes up and down to really deepen that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I think Moss, Moss and I both, experience in our separate careers that um people putting us in boxes never worked for either one of us it's like we we're both the kind of people we want to know the big picture and how we fit in so what you're saying really fits well with us we, we're loving it um now you have one book that's been out for a while what's the next one about so my current book which is somewhere uh, managing annoying people is really about who am I? We talked about it. The mirrors. How do I show up? What's going on? My new book is Managing Annoying Me. How do I get out of my <laughs> own way? I love that title. But, you know, it's funny because the title isn't testing well, so we're working on it. But um, it's really stories about how things, you know, there's a meme. I, I And I want to go back to that for a minute, uh, millennials, because millennials are kind of getting older now. But a lot of people, you know, for a long time, people were like, how do I manage millennials? Oh, my God. I never had a problem with it because what millennials want, which is really what most people want, how do I fit in? And when you give them that whole framework, and even if I'm only doing this piece, if you give me the whole, I'm, right, I'm this piece on the scatter plot, and you give me everything, if I know at least where I am, I'm going to have a better chance at at relating better and knowing where I fit in. And that's what millennials want. So that's, I say that in terms of this book, because that's really what this next book is really about. You know, okay, I get it. I got to look at my own behavior. I'm a leader. I'm modeling, you know, what I do. But what is it in my world that I really get stuck on? And I say millennials because there's a meme, and I don't know if you've seen it going around the internet. It's kind of slowed down. It was a young kid, ethnicity, very prominent in it. And the kid says, I worried so much about picking up my parents' annoying, uh, my parents' bad habits. I forgot about the annoying ones. And he's washing out Ziploc bags, right? <laughs> <laughs> because this was, you know, I, at least they weren't yelling, screaming and losing their minds, right? Or doing something yeah. ridiculous. And you don't even realize that you're washing out Ziploc bags, which is also crazy in this day and age. And that's what this book is about. Like, I have one chapter about the effort I go to save a 34 cent coffee pot, right? Instead of saying, oh, that didn't work and throwing it out. I'm washing another glass. I'm putting it in a cup. I'm putting it in the refrigerator. I'm thinking about what cream I can buy to go in. All I had to do was throw out the 34% pot and waste something so that I could move on with my day instead of spending half an hour trying to save a coffee pot. Because God forbid I'm not efficient. God forbid, you know, there's a hungry child or a hungry family somewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's those yeah. behaviors. It's, you know, when we're on the road and we did everything right and we ate a good breakfast and somebody cuts us off and all of a sudden we're pissed off. We're racing. We're almost getting into a car accident. And when we get to the office or wherever we're going, personal work, whatever, we are hyped up because we just had that road rage. Talk about not knowing how you showed up, right? And why, how people are reacting to you. I don't understand why everybody's so mad at me. What's wrong? I just nearly saved this, you know, saved it. I just nearly saved the whole traffic accident because I showed that guy who was king of the road. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, right? It's funny you say that because I, I have a story of I was in the gym and I was psyching myself up being angry to lift more. The problem was I had a date with my girlfriend afterwards. And I was a complete, absolute asshole for the next hour or so because I put myself into that space. Um, that, Matt, I could not have said that better. And we do it with people we love. So if we do it with people we love or we want to love, we do it with people that we work with, right? We think that that's the way we have to come at it. And we don't realize that is seeping into our everyday and how people react to us. And that's really how you started the question. How, 
how can I see how I show up? And, you know, the answer is, 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 is not a popular one. It's about awareness and mindfulness, right? You have to be, be aware enough to say, wait a minute, why is she looking at me like that? Or wait a minute, something doesn't feel right here. Or wait a minute, can what I just said be misunderstood? I did not understand, you know, when I wrote the book, Managing Annoying People, people said to me, what qualifies you to write this? I'm like, I'm annoying. I'm annoying. I finally saw it. I wrote it at first because... You know, when I managed 10,000 people, I created a team of mini-me's and I figured, oh, these are the, you know, the br the brightest of the bright, the this and that. And I'm going to show people how to manage these annoying people. And then I realized, I'm the one that did it. I'm the annoying one. Look in the mirror. So once you see that, then you have to slow down to actually, you know, realize, okay, I could bring be bringing something to this date that I didn't mean to, my attitude, right? <laughs> For sure. And for all the people that have absolutely loved what you talked about in this episode, because I know both me and Mike have, where can they reach out to you? Where would you prefer to reach out to you? I guess is a better question, actually. I love LinkedIn. I talk to Mads on LinkedIn. So definitely on LinkedIn, Eileen Marcus at LinkedIn. Um, my website is EileenMarcus.com. And I'm going to start dripping, I don't know on what platform yet, some uh, information about how not to save coffee pods, how not to drive angry, and a few other choice behaviors I do about catching yourself. So that is forthcoming. Most definitely. Well, feel free to send me the link so we can also put that down below What you have it so people can, can follow up with that, including myself. Thank okay. you again very much for taking oh, the time to come on. It was an thank absolute you. pleasure.